The universe of Minecraft is vast with secrets and subtle intricacies. Even with all we've brought to the table on this channel, there is much more to discuss about the very nature of these worlds. And with the recent introduction of Breezes and the Trial Chambers, even at their current unfinalized state, they still bring quite a bit of new lore to Minecraft. Whilst we're not focusing on the Trial Chambers today, as that'll be part of the next big theory video, for my 5k subspecial, thank you all so much by the way, we've grabbed five topics from suggestions from the whole time I've been doing theory videos. Diving into the lore of the breeze, what the witches and their presence in Minecraft Legends brings to the table, the unusual properties of fungi, the shrouded past of the mushroom monstrosity, and the secrets of the Endermites. If you enjoy the video, consider subscribing. And to start, we must once again journey back to a time of legends. In Minecraft Legends, blaze rods are a commonly used tool and weapon of the Piglin forces. Not only do their blaze runs throw them as spears, but their more advanced technologies such as blaze rod towers and armored towers utilize these rods as well. Yet, with all of these blaze rods, there are no blazes. With this, we are presented with two interesting possibilities. As we know, the Piglins, especially the Horde of the Bastion, were fueled by greed and conquest in their height of power. To fuel their endeavors, they needed resources. Resources such as netherite. In both legends and dungeons, we see structures that they had built, made of this material and their machinery. Giant drills as well as physical labor were used to mine more netherite until it was all gone. The official page from the Minecraft Nether update states, pure netherite, the strongest, most durable material in Minecraft, is no more. Piglins mined it all out. Now the only way to obtain it is by salvaging netherite scrap from ancient debris. We know that the piglins mined out all the netherite ore. By assumption, we could deduce that perhaps blaze as a material could have been another thing ripped completely from the nether. Why do we say blaze as a material? Well, blazes themselves show us why. Blazes are seemingly impossible in their structure. Their spinning rods and ability to hover are fascinating, but their blaze rods, which we've mentioned, hold the first key to understanding them. After all, they are rods, and rods are not something you would typically associate with any kind of natural creature. According to the Oxford Dictionary, rods are described as a long straight piece of wood, metal, or glass. Metal. Let's take a listen to the sounds of the blazes now. <coughs> Do you hear that? Metallic clanking. Blazes are not just some natural creature of the nether. They are golems. The fact that they only ever appear guarding structures, such as nether fortresses, is incredibly supportive of this idea. But even here, there's more to discuss. Another possibility of blaze as a material is that it may not have been mined at all. Perhaps more likely, it was created. The piglins are very adept with fire. Their structures are fortified with towers which rain blaze rods, and sometimes explosives upon their enemies. They've even constructed lava coils which use heat itself to create a shield around their portals. The leader of the most technologically advanced group, the Horde of the Bastion, known simply as the Unbreakable, also utilized magma cubes, creatures made of living molten rock, as a weapon for its own usage. As another example, the Lava Launcher is a mob attached with a cannon that stretches out a magma cube and fires it as just another projectile of normal molten rock. The Piglins clearly know how to use fire very well to the point where they can change fiery substances themselves. A type of alchemical process almost. Very successful. A kind of rubido even. They might have forged a brand new material at some point. One that would act as a highly versatile weapon. One so fascinating that others couldn't help but try their hand with it. Eventually, a new type of creature would be made. The blaze. But why stop there? Why not make more? The Breeze was born too. A counterpart for a different type of environment. Still made of a more solid and perhaps metallic material of the winds themselves, as we hear in their hurt sounds. But the question remains, who created them really? For that, we will have to wait for that answer in a future video. The 
Witches are one of the more mysterious aspects of Minecraft. However, for a long time, it hasn't been because of them really ever being complex or overly intricate in their lore. More so, it's because there simply wasn't enough to talk about overall. However, things have changed lately. With witch culture being expanded in Minecraft Dungeons earlier, and more so with their lore being iterated on in Minecraft Legends latest update, there is now so much more substance to actually dive into. Beginning with Legends, of course, Witches are found in an interesting spot. Upon entering the scene, Witches are already there in the world. Not only that, but they are villagers themselves. Witches can be found up in their huts, keeping to themselves mainly. At first, like the other villagers, they refuse to join you in your fight. At most, they'll attempt to use their brews in an attempt to defend their own villagers. But what exactly is their role in all of this? Witches are typically more known for their offensive brews. Well, to get a clue as to their role in the village, we can take a look at the songbook. The Minecraft Legends songbook states, These powerful alchemists have had enough of the piglins, and they're ready to throw their potions into the fight. Most importantly, they are referred to as alchemists. This makes sense due to their magic and usage of potions, but there's more. One of the goals of alchemy, according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, is the discovery of a universal cure for diseases and the discovery of a means to indefinitely prolonging life. Essentially finding cures for ailments and creating healing elixirs. This actually matches up with what we know witches to do. Witches often brew potions of healing for themselves, but can also throw them at illagers during raids in the original game. In Legends, after you help them defend a village from a piglin invasion and gain their trust, they gift you the secret to their brews, the cauldron, which strengthens your allies in battle. They may have emerged in villages as early herbalists and medics, using natural materials and ingredients for healing brews. In fact, this is similar to the witch doctors of real life, which act as healers, using more traditional and spiritual means of medicine. They would separate from the villagers, just as the warriors would have, being replaced by what we now see as the villager clerics. Perhaps their own eagerness to experiment with the brews is what caused their division. As piglins invade legends, they seem very eager to use their potions on these foes. They don't actively hate villagers. Again, they seem to mostly keep to themselves, suggesting their split might have been more so due to gradual changes in customs and culture. Although they do assist the villagers in raids, they never directly attack villagers ever. Witches seem to represent a more neutral third party in the overworld. They don't have any real resentment towards villagers, but they'll do what they have to if it benefits them. Doing it on your own can be hard though. So, in more current days, witches sometimes band together to form communities known as covens, where they practice their brews and magic as we see in Minecraft dungeons within the soggy swamp level. However, the swamps may not be the only location the witches reside. In Minecraft dungeons, Witches have found in more places other than just the swamps of the mainland. Within the dingy jungle and panda plateau levels, they can be found abundantly throughout this jungle island. In fact, not only can they be found roaming around, but some interesting structures can be found here as well. For example, the dingy jungle has a chance to generate structures known as jungle hats which are cabins made out of various jungle woods, with a couple of artifacts kept within, such as old statues. Oddly enough, witches often make their settlements near ruins like what we see here, in the soggy swamp, and more to come. The presence of books here, which aren't seen anywhere else in the island's ruins, and lit torches also lets us know that these sorts of places are still inhabited, likely, by the witches we see throughout the level. This isn't the only structure we see like this, however. Within the Panda Plateau, we can spot another structure that is extremely similar, although less overgrown. In a more intact state, we find ourselves the bamboo cabins. Like the jungle hats, they are made of the same materials and even have roughly the same exterior. However, hence their name, their walls and floors are lined with bamboo. The same regarding the jungle hat can be said here. Interestingly though, bamboo cabins can generate in multiple different areas in the level. One can appear at the beginning and one can appear near the end, signifying the several settlements that these witches have built for themselves all over. Even here, this is not where the witch's reach ends. Minecraft Dungeons also reveals to us that witches may also dwell within snowy biomes as well. This is made evident primarily with the level Lost Settlement, which takes place in a glacial region dotted with old buildings and structures from a now abandoned mining settlement. Within this environment, witches can be found at a couple of specific locations in the level. First to note, small stilted huts can be found throughout the level, almost identical in style to those found in the soggy swamp. These huts and ones found on ground level can more importantly 
conveniently appear in the forest section of this level. One of the only two places where witches spawn quite frequently here. Right before entering this section, you have the chance to happen across a side area, known simply as the Shelter. A glacial cavern that witches can appear within, which also contains a cabin you can enter. Potentially marking even this extra icy area as theirs. But what is the significance of all this? Well, aside from generally noteworthy information, there is another structure from the original game itself that could belong to the witches. The igloo. Igloos are one of the more interesting aspects of the various snowy biomes. Lone structures which contain a bed, carpet, and some basic utilities such as a crafting table and furnace. Sometimes, however, igloos will hide a secret beneath their rugs, which when unveiled, reveals a secret room. Within we can find a clue as to how we can cure villagers from underneath, with signs and materials left nearby. As we now know, witches also reside in snowy biomes, and their presence is felt here as well. Well, from the brewing stand to the cauldron, the practices of a witch can be seen. Not to mention the fact that witches can also appear in mountainous areas, in dungeons. Where igloos can be found in vanilla, within the snowy slopes biome, witches are travellers, being found throughout the overworld in nearly any location, presumably in search of ingredients for their brews. It would be expected that they would bring many things along with them, and within the igloos, we can find signs of this traveller's behaviour, with the potted cactus set on the spruce table of the secret room. Something that wouldn't normally be found anywhere near a snowy environment where an igloo is set. Witches have been using their brews for a variety of reasons, from sinister to more well-meaning. The igloo is an example of the latter, even if the ethics are a bit questionable. Although they are strange individuals, they are still intelligent in their processes and understand the powers that can be utilized in nature. Watch out when they come for you, because they're prepared for anything. Ever since the Mushroom Islands of Minecraft Vanilla, the fungi of the Minecraft universe have always been perhaps a source of niche intrigue. After all, mushrooms being able to attach themselves to cows of all things, and grow massive given the right conditions, isn't exactly the same as our reality. However, that would only be the start. With the Nether update, and more so now with Minecraft Legends, we've seen new relationships and attributes of fungi revealed in some rather interesting ways. In Minecraft Legends, Piglins use the spores of nether fungi to terraform the environment to make it sustainable for them, which we can see remnants of with nether racks surrounding the ruined portals in vanilla. Long ago, these ancient piglins utilized various types of technology to do this. Technology such as nether spreaders, spore towers, terror horns, and the air chopper. The nether spreader works via a rising piston which smashes down on clusters of nether wart in order to push the spores outwards, converting the land to nether rack. Spore towers work in the same way, but with more force, exerting more knockback with their heavy capped frames. What? Terror horns spread netherrack, but even faster, with the spores spreading farther. Air choppers can then be utilized to blow the spores much farther away, with a powerful gust of wind as mushrooms are loaded into the device. But how does this process even work? How do the spores of nether fungi cause these blocks to become netherrack? To answer that, we can take a look at real-life fungi. Bioremediation is the practice of introducing organisms, whether native or non-native, to heal an environment, usually via the consumption of pollutants. Mycoremediation, in turn, is the use of fungi in this endeavor. Fungi have the power to completely change the soil, helping environments recover from wildfires, oil spills, and more, by breaking down and consuming contaminants. According to Leila Darwish, as mentioned in the article, Mycoremediation brings the fungi fungi to waste disposal and ecosystem restoration, it is always better and ecologically safer to use native mushroom species when doing any kind of restoration work out in the land. Now, imagine the type of damage that could be done if not following through with such advice. Especially with the use of fungi, which have evolved separately in another dimension for so long. This is the process which piglins used long ago in their attempt to take the overworld although to a more fantastical degree. With mycoremediation as a weapon, they could change the very grounds of the overworld to better fit their needs. 
leaving behind the red block we know as Netherrack. And we know this is true, because even in vanilla, Netherrack is already deeply connected with fungi, in ways you may not have expected. For example, let's take note of the sounds of Netherrack. Netherrack sounds very odd. It's obviously a stone-type block, but it also sounds almost organic at times. But if we compare the creaking of Netherrack to that of placing fungi, their connection becomes more evident. Not only that, but netherrack and shroom lights share the exact same sounds when you walk across them. Showing that netherrack really is fungal treated rock and soil. What's interesting is, however, is that most of the nether is completely engulfed in netherrack, implying that first something had to have caused fungi to become the most dominant organism in the nether. Fungi most often feed on decomposing matter such as cadavers and rotting plant life. This would imply that the nether had a mass extinction event on its hands at one point, which caused fungi to thrive intensely. And true to this, massive fossils can be found of ancient, long dead creatures, with fungal roots sticking out of the soils where they are found. There were so many bones, in fact, that entire piglin structures, weapons, armor, and decoration were constructed just by the Horde of the Hunt, and in the Soul Sand Valleys alone. Most likely not just in the Soul Sand Valleys either, as we can spot multiple fossils within the standard wilds of the Nether within Legends cutscenes. This is, yet again, proof that a massive extinction event had overtaken the Nether at one point. The Nether is a naturally volcanic environment, due to being a cavernous dimension. An especially volcanic region makes it home here, however. The Basalt Deltas. What the narrator of Minecraft Dungeons calls a volatile wilderness of flowing lava and rough terrain. Basalt deltas are also described as remnants of volcanic eruptions in the patch notes of the 20w15a nether update snapshot, which implies something greater of them. And this is clear as the eruptions were so bad that Geiger counter type noises can be heard as common ambience, signaling considerable radioactivity present within the biome. This volcanic activity of the past must be what caused the nether to nearly become devoid of life, leaving countless species dead. Similar to the aftermath of the meteor strike which sparked the end of the dinosaurs, this wave of death would have provided excellent nutrition for fungi to feed and spread, leaving behind vast traces of netherrack in their path. The article A World Ruled by Fungi from Science Daily even says something similar, stating, During a very short period, from between a few months to a couple of years, the fungi and other saprophytes, which live on dead organisms must have been the dominating life form on Earth. The fungi during this time could have developed radiosynthesis, the process of essentially feeding off the energy emitted via radiation, which is something real fungi species can do very well. Lava contains many elements, including naturally radioactive ones, which can be spewed out of the lava itself, or even as toxic fumes during an eruption, which may explain the radiation present in the basalt deltas, as well as what more the nether fungi of today can feed on. Perhaps the energy from the lava itself. According to the article Radiation Junkies by David O'Connell, a study recently reported in PLOS 1 now shows that exposure of melanized fungal cells to ionizing radiation alters the electronic properties of melanin and actually enhances fungal growth, which means that the radiation might have helped them to become as complex and powerful as they are in Minecraft. After all, many types of fungi, such as lichens, which are a symbiotic relationship between algae and fungi, became far more complicated after the extinction of the dinosaurs. This is also supported by the article When the Dinosaurs Died, Lichen Thrived, which quoted the words of Jen Pang Huang, the first author of a study in scientific reports detailing the response of lichens to this mass extinction, who said, We thought that lichens would be affected negatively, but in the three groups we looked at, they seized the chance and diversified rapidly, as well as some lichens grow sophisticated 3D structures like plant leaves, and these ones to fill the niches of plants that died out. Fungi exists in both the nether and the overworld, however, both being much more complex than standard mushrooms. So how is this possible? Well, 
Fungi had to emerge from one of these dimensions first. And from what we already know, we can figure out which. Fungi may have actually originated in the nether. Besides their possible development into complexity, which we've mentioned before, there are other reasons we can draw to this conclusion. The overworld is sparse in fungi compared to the nether, which is heavily abundant in it, with seemingly more variety, which could indicate that the nether may be where fungi originates from. It is logically also far more likely for fungi to originate in a world we know to have vast quantities of complex fungal organisms than otherwise. We can also take a look at some of the mushrooms of Minecraft Legends. Huge brown mushrooms grow differently than in vanilla, with drooping features to their caps, similar to huge nether fungi, which may imply that at this point, the evolutionary process hasn't yet let them diverge as nearly as they have now. These mushrooms also still retain their shroom lights, which appear similarly to those we also see in Legends. These shroom lights seem to be a vestige Stigial structure due to their comparative dimness with nether shroom lights, likely from their common ancestors with the nether fungi, which have since faded due to lack of necessity in the brighter overworld. Faded fungal structures that highly resemble nether fungi in the time of legends that have since faded further indicate that the fungi of our world evolved from the nether. After all, gaining new evolutionary traits is more difficult and rare than losing and reducing existing ones, as it requires some kind of particularly heavy pressure, which further amplifies this idea that nether fungi had to have come first. Now, this leads us into our next topic, piglins and their relationship to fungi. Fungi in the Minecraft universe can often engage in symbiotic relationships with complex life as shown with mushrooms, clucksrooms, and of course, piglins. More overworld mobs have a more outright display of symbiosis that changes them greatly, which represents the more split evolutionary pathway of nether and overworld fungi. These relationships primarily form so that the fungi may spread to new locations, with sheddings of matter and spores. For mushrooms and clucksrooms, this relationship is an example of commensalism, with the fungus benefits, but the hosts gain nothing in a way that is neither harmful nor beneficial. Nether fungi have more mutualistic relationships with piglins, however. These spores helped the piglins breathe in the overworld without zombifying, a concept not just of legend, as we see with the piglin merchant in dungeons. This works similar to how certain fungi work to destroy bacteria, which has been utilized to make antibiotics like penicillin to prevent and treat major infections. According to the article Weird Science, Penicillin in the Cell Wall, penicillin kills most of the bacterial cells but it does not kill them all. Bacteria resistant to the effects of the antibiotic remain, but in small numbers so they can be eliminated from the body by the immune system. The fungus seems to have entirely replaced the piglin immune system, as they cannot fight the zombie infection present within them at all without spores, and succumb to it fairly quickly. This is also shown in regards to the healing factors fungi present to piglins. Healing is done primarily by the immune system, but it is also done by the fungi of the nether itself as seen in Legends, with the use of piglin spore medics and air choppers, which heal piglins caught in their spore-filled gusts pointing to this immune system-like replacement. Interesting to note is that piglins zombify not just in the overworld, but also in the end, a place with no sign of any zombies. Zombified piglins are also found in the nether, rarely in crimson forests, but most often in places with less nether fungi, and by proxy, spores, such as the nether wastes, indicating that their zombie infection originates in the nether itself. According to a now-deleted post from Mojang, made during development of the nether update, when zombie pigmen were changed into zombified piglins, there is implied to be a difference between zombies and zombification. To quote the article, why change zombie to zombified? This is a very good question that we're not going to answer just yet. There are reasons, very interesting reasons, and we hope you'll trust us to take the right time as we make plans for the future of Minecraft. This may provide our answer. Zombies and the most undead are a product of magic and necromancy, much of which is fueled by either the night of the overworld or from the necromancers of a forgotten nameless kingdom as seen in Minecraft. Dungeons. Zombified piglins and zoglins by association, on the other hand, are a product of biological compromise of their own bodies, it seems, more so than magic. This could be the difference mentioned between standard zombies and zombification, which explains why zombified piglins act so differently from zombies of the overworld. Who knows what other odd secrets the natural history of Minecraft may have to offer. If it can be as wild as that, imagine what it must be like living it.
With fungi's most unusual and diverse variety of abilities, it's no wonder piglins of the past and even present utilized its properties. However, focusing on that would deny us to some degree on how fungi have played a role in the overworld. The mushroom monstrosity is a fascinating example of this. At first glance, it could appear to some to simply be a redstone monstrosity overgrown with red mushrooms. Some have presented the idea that the mushroom monstrosity could be the same machine seen in the Fiery Forge, although now left to rot. However, this is unlikely. When the redstone monstrosity is defeated, its head is mounted to the wall of the house at the camp. It would also make no sense for the remains of the redstone monstrosity to somehow make its way to the mushroom island all the way from the fiery forge for no particular reason. This construct perhaps may not even be the arch Illager's doing. Although Archie believes he was the first to construct a monstrosity, just as with the redstone golems at his side, this may not be the case. Its creation would also bring into question as to why it was simply left there, as well as why it was never utilized during the main story. This may be be yet another remnant of the orb's past, just as Highblock Keep itself had always existed before Archie came to rebuild it. This can be implied through the placement of the runes themselves, which are needed to unlock what is referred to as the Mu Room, which are placed far from each other in very inconvenient places. It's also left open as a possibility in the Minecraft Dungeons novel itself. As it states in Chapter 20, when Archie is considering the idea of the monstrosity, he wondered if the idea had come from him, or had been planted in his mind by the orb. He didn't let it bother him for more than an instant. However, it is clear that Archie did eventually come to know about this place, as made clear from the statues and podiums placed straight from Highblock Castle, as well as piston launch pads placed on the island itself, similar to what is seen in the Obsidian Pinnacle, indicating a small expedition here. No other signs of major Illager occupation exist here though. However, much relating to these connected locations seems to be older than his rise to power. For example, places like the Desert Temple's rune rooms show signs of exposure taken over time. Although the room is hidden away and sealed, it's become sandy in a way that may not have happened recently, given this information. This applies to the room part of the High Block Halls level as well. Although one might believe that this massive castle to be a new construct from the Arch Illager, Archie realizes this may not be the case at all. According to the novel in Chapter 12, although they had just built the place, in Archie's mind, the keep didn't seem fresh and new. Instead, it felt like it had been there forever, waiting to be rediscovered. Archie and the orb hadn't built it, but revealed it. This is what has happened with the rune room in Highblock Keep. It had been locked away as well. It was one of the few things that remained from Highblock Castle, originally similar to the ruins Archie walks past and into within the opening cinematic. If you've seen one of our previous theories, Broken God, you'd know that we've come to the conclusion that beings of the end had constructed this place long ago for a variety of interesting reasons worth checking out in that video. And we can see their presence made very clear within the rune rooms themselves. The rune rooms are the secret areas scattered across the entire mainland in a variety of locations, which already have their own histories as entirely separate civilizations. From the crypts of the Creeper Woods, to the old forgotten walls of the Pump pastures, to even the desert temple itself. These rooms and their runes are all over. Their paths are made up of bedrock, supported over a foggy purple sea of stars below. These rune rooms were created by ancient Endescent. In modern days, when the Endescent take the eyes of Ender from the end portal, they retreat to their own secluded areas where they place not only bedrock, but purple starry void blocks. Almost exactly the same as we see with the rune rooms, although to a smaller scale. When picking up the runes, we can also hear different Enderman sounds in the ambience briefly. When asked about it, a lead gameplay developer known as Laura DeLorens replied stating, We cannot say, but there might be some clues later. Aside from the potential of a new character, this also shows to us yet another connection these rune rooms have with the end and the beings from it. In short, these rooms were placed by beings before the Archer Lizard's time, even possessing the vengeful heart of Ender's visage, molded into the golden button of the Moo Room's locked door, something that has never been shown as a symbol of the Illager Empire, but rather one of the ends region upon the overworld, as seen in the Gale Sanctum's strange lanterns. But there is perhaps even more to these rooms, and the mushroom monstrosity itself. Once again, 
the Enderlings did not work alone, as they usually didn't during this era. As we've explained in the Broken God Theory and the Ancient Illager Theory, long ago, they spread their influence, working with several civilizations, from villagers to illagers, and perhaps now, witches. Witches, as we've discussed, hold fascinating secrets, yet the runes themselves of these rune rooms may offer the biggest starting clue as to how they fit into all this. As we can see, the runes themselves display various letters of the Illager Alt font, which is used by both villagers and illagers alike, despite the name. This tells us that alongside Enderling Presence, that of a villager-type civilization took part in the construction of the rune rooms, and likely the happenings of the Mushroom Island itself. These rooms are particularly magical, hovering and glowing with some kind of power. Surprisingly, witches already have their own connections with rune magic already. The description of the Heartstealer sword states, This rune blade is infused with dark witchcraft, which sets a precedent for witches using magical runes. Yet, there exists a deeper connection between witches and the machines of Enderling design. Within the heart of the Soggy Swamp's sinister dealings, where we defeat the corrupted cauldron, we can find the broken broken, cracked head of a redstone golem. This head appears to be quite old, sustaining damage with the redstone dimmed to nothing. This head could have been given to them by Archie, but it makes no sense as it's heavily damaged and they have no use for it. Rather, this redstone golem head may have been an artifact of the witches themselves. When the Enderlings had influence over the overworld, they reached out to several civilizations, and if the witches were one of them, it would explain the runes and rune rooms that led to the Mushroom Monstrosity. Since they hold a redstone golem as an artifact, it lends further credibility to the fact that they may have been partially responsible for the creation of the Mushroom Monstrosity, if they've encountered similar technologies. It is also important to note that the Mushroom Monstrosity is not just overgrown by red mushrooms, but it is actively designed with this fungus in mind. It is able to shoot out explosive mushrooms at high efficiency, as well as being able to call upon the mushrooms themselves back up. Witches love fungi. It is a key ingredient in many brews. In fact, the Minecraft Dungeons guidebook specifically saying there are plenty of potion ingredients lying around, while pointing specifically at a cluster of red mushrooms. If they love their potion ingredients, a mushroom island would have been the perfect place to be, and they very likely did venture there. Upon searching the mushroom island, the architecture scene consists of many rope bridges, similar to what we see most often, and almost exclusively in the soggy swamp level, where witches reside. But in one section, which always appears, we can find a lone hut, shaped and built with materials almost exactly the same as a witch hut from vanilla Minecraft. This hut also shares similarities with that of Minecraft Legends. Both huts are teeming with fungal life as part of the architecture itself, also sharing mushrooms growing up top on the roof. The witch huts of Legends are also covered in various layers of mycelium, which implies that witches, in their history, have journeyed to the mushroom islands, which further aligns with what we've presented. With the truth possible, Possibly unraveling, the presence of Enderlings and witches becoming clear, one last question remains. What has caused these typically friendly mushrooms to become so aggressive? Let's look at the mushroom monstrosity. Take note of how it is referred to as the mushroom monstrosity and not the mushroom monstrosity, which purposely points out the possible relationship it has with mushrooms. Perhaps this monstrosity has been used to corrupt the mushrooms themselves, leaving them angry and subject to its will, allowing the machine to summon them when it's in need. As stated in the Minecraft Dungeons novel, Rise of the Archeologer by Mike Forbeck, the redstone golems and monstrosities are given form then life by the orb itself. Chapter 20 states, He zoomed down into it and saw the golem mold was filled with cooling redstone. The creature was ready to be imbued with life. All it needed was some help from the orb. Although the orb has the power to give the golems life, it can do so much more. It can imbue the golems themselves, not just with life, but with new power even. In chapter 15, as Archie journeys into the molten mountain in which he builds the fiery forge, the orb uses its power to keep the redstone golem with him safe from the heat itself. A bit of the orb's glow seemed to separate from it and drift out to the creature. There it settled upon it, coating it from one end to the other, and then seemed to be absorbed into its rocky skin. Immediately thereafter, the redstone golem strode forward right past Archie, the 
massive creature walked straight down to the nearest lava flow and stood by its edge, as if it was contemplating walking straight in. Then it did just that. Archie gasped, afraid that the redstone golem would be destroyed. Rather than melting in the lava though, it stood there knee deep in the glowing rock, as if it had just waded into a delightful hot spring. If the Orb of Dominance can provide power such as that, our best possible explanation really does reside within the Mushroom monstrosity itself, once a keeper of the Witch's Bovine Path, now left abandoned. Endemites are perhaps one of the oddest aspects of the end. Their development history leaves something to be desired, even with Mojang themselves. However, they present very interesting world building for the Minecraft universe in some unexpected ways. Endermen hate them. An Enderman will attack an Endermite upon a glance in the original game. Don't mistake this as simply some type of cruel behaviour on their part, however. These cycloptic creatures will attack first if given the chance. At least on Bedrock Edition. In fact, Endermites do not behave at all how you'd expect from an organism such as themselves. Compared to their silverfish counterparts in Minecraft Dungeons, their lack of self-preservation is especially unusual in an environment where they could fall at any moment. Often, they will charge straight towards their target with no regard for their own lives. It is especially made even more puzzling as Endermites don't actually bite the target, unlike Silverfish. Rather, they stomp at them with apparently magical power. They don't thrust themselves to certain death because of hunger. They do it just for the sake of it, it seems. It is actually unknown if they even need to eat, and if this is the case, it begs the question as to whether anything in the end at all eats for necessity, especially given their apparent composition. It all makes their role in the end even more unusual. Their relationship with Endermen and likely Enderlings overall especially so. Endermites aren't just found throughout the End's ancient expanse. It's possible for them to be summoned anywhere with the use of an Enderpearl. Something found through slaying Endermen primarily. Though this may not be the only method we can infer from their presence and structures Endermen took part in creating, as we've mentioned in the Broken God Theory. But what are ender pearls. These gemstones are sought after in every speedrun, or for anyone seeking to utilize the teleportive abilities they retain. Most simply chalk it up to some kind of organ. However, pearls are a phenomenon that exists in real life that we can compare to. Pearls are structures which are formed by mollusks, such as clams and oysters around an irritant, such as a grain of sand or a parasite, as a natural defense mechanism. Some may claim that ender pearls may form from shulkers, since they they most resemble a mollusk with their shelled appearance. However, shulkers never actually drop the enderpearls. Endermen do, however. Their hostile relationship with endermites makes more sense if they were parasitic towards them. The question is though, how does an endermite infiltrate an enderman's body? Oddly enough, it seems as if endermites don't emerge only from enderpearls. In the end portal cutscene from Minecraft Dungeons, six endersent climb out of the end portal with the goal to deactivate it in their mission to keep any more invaders from entering their world. But why did the Enderson and the Enderman in this cutscene use the end portal? Judging from their portal particles, and the Enderman already appearing in every dimension, this almost seems redundant. Let's analyze the end portal's mechanics to figure this one out. In canon, as Minecraft Dungeons reveals, end portals don't take us straight to the center of the end, similar to the nether portal. They teleport us into the end, in a location relative to our entry point in the overworld. Hence why the Illages appear with the end portal's particles in roughly the same area. However, unlike the nether portal, the end portal isn't as precise and outputs us in a broad space instead of a specific point, as we can see with the Illagers and our own starting area in the End Wilds. End portals also don't create their own entryway to get back from the other side. From this information, we could deduce that perhaps they had created a link to the portal we see in the Stronghold, which could explain how the End Descent climbed directly out of the End portal itself. Their own teleportation between dimensions might even be as imprecise as an unlinked End portal, which could explain why they used the End portal at all in this moment, and the existence 
existence of a link from the other side of a portal being built for this purpose isn't just pure speculation. It was once part of the End Wilds level, as can be seen in this image released by the Minecraft Dungeons Twitter account before the Echoing Void DLC released. A broken end portal was once conceived as a set piece for the dimension. If not an end portal, perhaps it would have been something else. But nonetheless, a link to enter the overworld directly from the Stronghold's end portal was set up for this reason of imprecision. And this brings us back to the Endermites. The reason the Ender Scent emerged to deactivate the end portal at all is to stop any more Illagers, which have been invading the end, from entering. In the cutscene that portrays this event, we see Endermites emerge from the portal as well, crawling away shortly after. However, only a few Endermites are shown to have escaped through this portal. But when we arrive at the Stronghold, the portal still inactive, Endermites can be found not just by the portal room, but all over in numbers much higher than what we saw before. The only possible explanation being that they had been coming through the end portal for a long time before this moment. This should be impossible, as there should have been no set link in the end to make for an entryway for these Endermites to enter the overworld from. So where did these Endermites come from? Could they simply have popped into existence from the end portal itself? Well, there may be more to them than we first thought. The Void is the answer. The key to understanding how these creatures emerge from all sorts of different, seemingly unrelated places. The end portal is formed by Void magic. Listening to its sound effects, it becomes more clear with its liquid-esque consistency on display, gurgling and dripping with etherealness. <laughs> Similar to various void substances, such as void liquid, and making sounds similar to the void effects. Of course, one of its greatest connections with the void is its starry appearance. But even this isn't all. The end gateways are powerful technologies, which allow users to travel even vaster distances in the end than is possible with any other type of natural teleportation. Of course, it is obvious that the end portal and the end gateways portal are of the same consistency, appearing identically, with each even the same idle ambience, so it should come as no surprise that any details found in one can tell us a lot about the other. The end gateway, as we find in Minecraft Dungeons, is deactivated, but once turned on with a simple interaction, summons a shadowy vortex that reveals the portal within, ending the level as we step inside. This vortex is the same one as that of the Portal Pop cosmetic respawn flare, which depicts a dark portal. These dark portals can be found within the end, hovering above pools of void liquid with endermite being able to spawn within these pools, as well as being formed by the Vengeful Heart of Ender as part of its Void Pool ability, where Endermites also spawn directly from. This further cements End Portals as that of Void Magic. But what does this all mean? Well, Endermites miraculously appear from the End Portal itself, a Void-based construct. They also tend to appear in Void Pools, as well as Dark Portals formed from Void Power itself. Not only that, but Endermites are found very abundantly in places where Void is constantly Concentrated, such as the Obsidian Cavern or the Obsidian Gate Tower, which overflows with void liquid and void blocks in its state of ruin. The Heart of Ender can scatter Endermites in a manner which seems uncomfortable for it, as if they're an irritant, shaking like a wet dog as the Endermites fly about. And it does use voidic powers to teleport all around the end, as we see in one of the cutscenes. Endermites have a very clear connection to the void. Similar to Enderlings, they are made of the substance, being immune to its effects and the harmful touch it has to all just like the Enderlings. However, they're so in tune, it seems, that they just manifest from it directly, perhaps even with the Endermen themselves, as made clear by the formation of pearls inside of them. So not only are they parasites, but they're also pests which can emerge from some of their very technologies, making their hatred very understandable. Oddly similar to the Redstone Bug from one of the April Fools updates as well. A developer panel for Minecon Earth 2017 actually provides us with perhaps Perhaps even more information. At one point in development, Dinnerbone wanted to explore the idea of Enderman teleportation and stated, so what if whenever they're teleporting, they're kinda going through this extra dimension that has this bad stuff in it, such as Endermites, and whenever they do teleport, they leave some of this bad stuff behind. This idea never fully developed, which is important to note, as Dinnerbone says right after
after. That was the initial idea. It didn't really come to fruition like that. They're still kind of there, but I don't think that grand plan is going to be implemented anytime soon. The idea that they were from an in-between type of place still stuck with them. As another developer says, that's interesting though. So they are really from an in-between place, you can say. Although this grand plan was never realized, it just may as well have been at least partially reworked into something very interesting. This in-between world idea may have become the void itself. Endemites last a limited time in Minecraft, despawning no matter the distance or tension paid by the nearby player. Endemites also display portal particles, just like Endermen, but lack the ability to teleport, which begs the question as to what that detail might be for. Their despawning behavior may be them being pulled back to the place where they emerged, the void. Hence their particles being pulled inwards towards themselves. This detail is even found in Minecraft dungeons, with their particles displaying the same behavior, while Enderman particles simply hover and swirl around them, suggesting different behavior. After all, if the respawn anchor's particle movement was important, this is certainly worth noting. Who would have known how interesting Endermites could have been? However, this still leaves a couple of questions. Why do creatures such as Endermites and Enderlings sound like beings from other dimensions? Who is the mysterious voice speaking to us as we pick up the runes? And perhaps somehow more intriguingly, how does the Endermite pet help us understand Minecraft's first enemies? While some things can't quite be answered yet, other answers may perhaps be revealed soon. With all these secrets being revealed and questions left somewhat answered, what do you want to see covered in a future theory video? The next theory video is a big one, branching from the broken God and Dark Past Villagers theories. So if you haven't caught up with them, give them a watch. Or try to figure out what type of material Blaze is. Seeming metallic, but also having a powdered form. I'd love to see your comments on what it could be, or just in general. If your theory craving has been fulfilled, then check out some of my other content. Thank you all so much for the support so far. I've loved bringing you all videos so far, and I want to continue to do so. You all make this so worth it. Thank you for watching. Hope to see you in another video. But until then, have a good day or night.